Okay, good afternoon. So happy Monday afternoon and uh, starting a new week. Before we know it, we are going to get to the end. So this is the uh, week before last. Uh, next week is going to be the final one. So uh, fast semester as is always the case over uh, the summer. And uh, so what we have for now uh, is of course your lab exam number what number two which is in progress as uh, i deliver the lecture here so hopefully you guys will find uh, time to turn that one in your lecture exam number three would be held on wednesday june the 23rd um, and so i sent out the study guide for that as well and then thursday again we have yet another practical that would be number three and it deals with muscles something that we are looking at uh, hopefully today and tomorrow uh, so those were some of the things to keep in mind. Uh, again, your lecture quizzes that are posted on the Connect website, they're still there. So please remember to turn uh, complete and submit those as well, uh, at least before the deadline that would be approaching fast as well. And then the case studies is yet another uh, assignment that we will be working towards. Um, if some of you have already finished it, get done early, please feel free to share your presentations with me. So you don't have to necessarily wait uh, till the very end to do that. Okay, so with those reminders, uh, we shall go ahead and start our uh, chapter 10 for today. Again, we are keeping in with the schedule. So muscles is what we are looking at. So let's talk about their development first. Embryologically, the muscles are derived from uh, what primary germ layer? That would be your mesoderm. So remember, we had the three primary germ layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. And uh, ectoderm, of course, was the outermost layer that gave rise to your skin and central nervous system and lens of the eye and those things. A mesoderm is the middle layer. So whatever lies underneath the skin, and that includes muscles. So muscles primarily arise from um, the mesoderm. Uh, of the embryo. And then muscles come in three different types that we will be looking at today. Uh, skeletal muscles, cardiac muscle, and then smooth muscle, right? So um, as far as the function of those muscles are concerned, well, let's uh, talk about their outstanding features. So one thing that all muscles, regardless of what category they belong to do unanimously, uniformly is contract. So they are contractile. That's something we have to remember, all right? All muscles contract. Uh, but they do so uh, using different mechanisms and for different amount, periods of time, uh, depending on, again, what type of muscle you're exactly talking about. So here are some of the functions or the physiology of uh, skeletal muscle. That's what we are starting out with, uh, your body movements, right? So, and remember, skeletal muscle uh, is that tissue which is under your voluntary control, okay? So if you decide to pick up a glass of water and extend your hand and then uh, grasp the glass and then bring it up to your lips, all of that is what uh, skeletal muscles are capable of, capable of doing, all right? So body movements, as you see here, speaking, breathing, swallowing, all of that is accomplished using skeletal muscles, uh, maintenance of your posture. And as humans, we are unique in the sense that we are the only truly bipedal species. So we need especially strong back muscles, all right? And leg muscles also, so our back, leg, and also uh, the gluteal muscles, the muscle, the buttock muscles, are the most well-developed, all right? And uh, which has a, an interesting evolutionary background, which has resulted in our preference for different types of muscles. So uh, I'll basically just go ahead and mention it here. Um, so they did the study in, at the University of Scotland, I believe was where it was done. And uh, basically what they did was, uh, and this was the uh, social sciences department there, uh, so they simply asked uh, the students, uh, the female and the male students uh, who identified themselves as a heterosexual or straight individuals about their uh, preference for different body parts uh, and in particular with reference to the muscles, all right? And so they were asked to rank the different uh, body regions and the muscles accompanying those in order of uh, attraction, all right? Uh, so what muscles basically did they find uh, the sexiest? Uh, that was the question, okay? And so they did come up with uh, a list, okay? 
And uh, I'm sure you have your own list going on in your head. Uh, so let's start with uh, uh, the one uh, in third place. And that was your, um, those were the biceps, of course, uh, the famous bicep muscles uh, that whether you watch Popeye the Sailor Man or, uh, you know, that is in the popular uh, consciousness. So uh, no surprises there really. Uh, then the runner up was uh, the gluteus maximus. So that is the buttock muscle again, and maybe no surprises there either, okay? Uh, a lot of people find those uh, quite enticing. Uh, and then the clear winner uh, among both groups was your, uh, the almighty six pack, the abdominal muscles, a strong core, okay? So maybe like I said, the results in and of themselves were not surprising at all, uh, but if you think like a, uh, behavioral or rather an evolutionary psychologist or an evolutionary biologist. Uh, what is so special about these muscles? Okay. Well, they look good and they're quite attractive. Uh, that much we know. But the question is why? Is there something to it? Uh, and if you think and uh, dig a little bit deeper, uh, then it all starts to make sense, right? Let's start with the biceps. Uh, why the biceps muscles are so uh, considered uh, so appealing is because of course uh, we since we are bipedal we walk on two legs our hands are completely free and arms uh, to make tools weapons cultures art architecture design um, inventions innovations whatever uh, makes us human uh, it's all made possible because we have hands and arms that are able to uh, do all these things right and so of course the biceps muscles they are the uh, the mainstay of your manual capability, uh, which is there again, because you are completely bipedal. No other creature can use their arms and hands like we do. Uh, if you're thinking about like the great apes, the gorillas and orangutans and all chimpanzees, those creatures, they're knuckle walkers again. Remember, they're not truly bipedal. They can use their hands while squatting, right? Uh, but when they start uh, traveling in uh, troops or groups, uh, they are knuckle walkers. So they, they, they use their knuckles, right? Um, we don't. All right, so then uh, the buttock muscle, gluteus maximus. Uh, so again, not many people are surprised, but uh, again, if you look at their evolutionary function, um, the stronger the gluteus maximus, the more erect uh, and more uh, upright your stance is, uh, which makes you a better hunter, which makes you a better walker, better runner, someone who's able to spot prey, to avoid danger, uh, someone who's able to lift uh, heavy objects, maybe there's, you know, their partner or their family or kids, whoever, um, and walk upright, uh, having a strong uh, gluteus maximus allows you to, and standing up from a squatting position, right? Same with your abdominals, the six pack muscles, uh, they indicate someone who is a bipedal walker. Um, so when you stand upright, your core basically supports the weight of your upright stance. And the stronger the core muscles, uh, the more physically fit you are, the lesser the chance of developing things like hernias. Hernias when one of your internal organs kind of pops out of its covering, okay? So it makes perfect sense. It's not just something that appears attractive uh, for no reason, right? Because you might think, okay, in sexual terms, it's enticing, uh, but there's a whole evolutionary biology behind uh, the utility of those areas. So fascinating study that was done. Protection and support, again, going back to hernias, as, a, as I was mentioning, you, you need strong core muscles to support and hold the body organs in place. Um, elimination of materials. So for example, when you're defecating or urinating, some, you have to contract your abdominal muscles, something called the Valsalva maneuver. Uh, and so that helps with those body functions and heat production or thermoregulation. Now that is one function that uh, a lot of people don't associate with muscles uh, often, right? But that is exactly what muscles do as well. When you're cold, your muscles shiver right? And the shivering brings up your body temperature, your erector pili muscles, which are skeletal muscles uh, in your uh, hypodermis, right? They also contract to give you goosebumps. And goosebumps is when your hair stand on end, and that traps heat as well. So thermoregulation. All right, so here we're looking at the different characteristics of skeletal muscle, as I mentioned, uh, contractility is right up there, muscles are able to contract and expand, relax and uh, flex, right? Flex and extend. Muscles are excitable. So that means if you give them an electrical current, they are going to move, they're going to contract, right? Uh, 
Um, and so back in the day, they used to do this famous um, frog leg, ex frog leg uh, experiment, right? So they'll have a, a dissected frog leg not attached to the animal itself, which is quite obviously dead um, at that point. And what they did was they connected uh, um, some live wires to the leg tissue of the frog. And then as soon as the wires were connected to a battery, to, a, to an electricity source, um, the uh, frog leg would start twitching and dancing about. So it was quite a uh, spectacular scene there, right? And it would freak people out because they'd see a leg just kind of dancing by itself. Uh, but that basically testifies to the excitability and the conductivity of the muscle, right? It's able to conduct electricity. Uh, it's extensible, so you can extend the muscle, right? Uh, and it's elastic, meaning when once you stretch it or extend it, it's going to recoil and assume its original shape. Five major functions of skeletal muscle. Uh, we just basically look, looked at those, right? So support, uh, movement, protection, uh, posture maintenance, um, all of those. The characteristic of contractility, muscles can expand, uh, flex and contract. They're extensible and they're elastic too, okay? So once you've stretch them, they're going to recoil back to their original position. And that's how you get cramps, by the way, right? What is a cramp? Cramps happen uh, when, um, as an example, somebody starts participating in physical exercise without doing um, stretching exercises, right? Without stretching. So what happens is, let's say you're playing a game of basketball and you haven't really warmed up before the game. And so you slip or you make it turn at an awkward angle, you end up overstretching one of your calf muscles, right? So when it overstretches, that is felt by the nerves supplying the muscle. And so how does the muscle re uh, respond to this overstretch? Not surprisingly, by overcontracting. And that is what a cramp is. It's simply a response to overstretch of the muscle. And that's why it's so important to warm up, to do stretching exercises to kind of like break into the muscle so that they don't overcontract and give you a cramp. So each skeletal muscle is considered to be an organ because there's uh, cells, muscle cells in there, there's blood vessels, there's sensory nerves, there's uh, connective tissue, whole bunch of things in there, right? And so here in this picture, you can see a muscle fiber, okay? Um, and it's a cross section that you can see. The so first of what you see here is uh, the bone to which this muscle is attached and therefore it's called the skeletal muscle, right? This tissue here is what is called a tendon. Tendon is connective tissue that connects muscle to bone, which you can see. Then here's the whole bundle of muscle, right? And the entire bundle is covered on the outside uh, by a membrane called the perimysium, okay? So here's the perimysium. It surrounds the whole, the bundle here, okay? That connective tissue that you're seeing, in addition to tendon, there is something called the fascia. So deep fascia, okay? It's a type of connective tissue as well. Again, you have uh, regular connective tissue, right? Uh, dense regular connective tissue here. All right, so within the uh, this big bundle of muscle, you have these individual fascicles, these compartments that you can see. Each of those are surrounded by uh, Actually, the, the one that was surrounding the entire bundle was called epimyceum, epi, outside, all around, right? And then these individual fascicles are covered by the perimyceum. And then within those individual fascicles, you can see these individual muscle fibers, each of which is surrounded by what is called the endomyceum. So three different protective layers, uh, epimyceum, perimyceum, and endomyceum, okay? So here is the connective tissue that um, connects muscle to bone, as we can see here. So you have what uh, is called tendon, right? And then something called aponeurosis, which is again, uh, a tendon, but it's flat, it's flattened, okay? Flat tendon is what aponeurosis is all about. Uh, for example, the tendon that you have at the top of your head. So this muscle here is called the frontalis muscle, which makes perfect sense, right? Uh, this is the frontal region. And the muscle at the back is called the occipitalis, which again makes sense. So, and these two bellies of muscles are connected together by means of a flat tendon or aponeurosis at the top called the, uh, the epicranial aponeurosis, okay? So it's a flat tendon connecting the two muscles. Deep fascia, again, dense irregular connective tissue, uh, and then superficial fascia, which is basically made up of 
areolar and fat tissue. And this separates your muscles from your skin. So basically, if you're working as a surgeon, uh, you, when you cut into an organ, let's say you're, you're doing an appendectomy, removing the appendix, right? Or uh, a herniotomy, uh, taking care of a hernia or something. Whenever you cut into the body, you're gonna go through uh, six different layers, all right? So what are those? First, it's skin, epidermis, right? Then the hypodermis, then uh, adipose, connective tissue, then superficial fascia, then deep fascia, right? And then you get to the muscle. So you're gonna go in that order, okay? Uh, to get to the underlying organs. So layers of uh, tissue, a surgeon cuts through. Okay. So uh, what we see here is your skeletal muscles are pretty vascular, right? They have good blood supply. Uh, they are also uh, pretty sensitive, so they have good innervation, uh, lots of nerves going there as well. All right, so in this picture, we are going to look at a cross-section of the skeletal muscle and see what different uh, components make it up. So again, here's the whole bundle. You see the epimyceum uh, on the very outside, then the perimyceum here, and each individual fiber, muscle fiber, would be surrounded by uh, endomysium. Okay, so you see all of those uh, in this picture. Then you are looking at these uh, green and blue channels, right? And they are basically called uh, the transverse tubules, as you can see here, or the T-tubules, T-tubules or transverse tubules. Their function is to act as a reservoir, as a storage point for calcium ions. So they pretty much like spread, hold on to calcium ions and spread them throughout the body of the muscle. And you need calcium ions for muscle contraction, okay? That's what the T-tubules are for, as you can see. Uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum, it's the name for endoplasmic reticulum, which is found within muscle. And what does sarcoplasmic reticulum do? It makes protein, uh, which the muscle itself is made up of, and then distributes the protein all throughout the, the body of the muscle, as we see here. Uh, and you also see a bunch of mitochondria, maybe not so much in this picture, but there's a whole lot of mitochondria here too, uh, to power the uh, constant contraction of muscles. Oh, they, here they are. You can see the mitochondria here. Um, they're interspersed throughout the tissue, right? Right, so in this picture, in this close-up, you can see um, the sarcolemma, which is the membrane surrounding this muscle fiber, and the transverse tubules, all right? Here's the sarcolemma, the muscle membrane or the cell membrane of the muscle, whichever way you want to put it. And then you have these... Uh, ion channels, potassium ion channels and the sodium channels, right? You also have calcium channels here. Uh, and the T-tubules, transverse tubules, remember, uh, basically act as uh, calcium stor <clears throat> storage points. <clears throat> Excuse me, and that's what you're looking at here. So there you go, here's, here's your um, calcium channels, right? Uh, calcium is critical for muscular contraction. So no calcium, no contraction. So you're looking at different types of proteins, which are found within the, uh, what is called the triad as well, the muscle triad, which is made up of the transverse tubule, which has the calcium channel, ion channels, uh, cytosol, right? Uh, which is the cytoplasm within the muscle cell, and then what are called terminal cisternae. And they contain these three proteins, cal cal calciquestrin, calmodulin, right? And calcium pumps. So what cal uh, calcic, calsequestrin and calmodulin do is they hold on to calcium ions. As you can see here, these white spheres, those are calcium ions and they bind to the those two proteins. Uh, the calcium pump again is used for pumping calcium uh, out of the muscle, okay? Because you don't want your muscle to contract permanently, which is what calcium will do. All right, next up, we are looking at what are called uh, thick and thin filaments, all right? The other name for thick filaments is myosin filaments. Uh, such as these, these are myosin thick protein filaments. And then you have the thin protein filaments called actin, which look like this, okay? Um, as we can see here uh, in this picture, okay? And then there's a few other things to notice. Uh, one is look at the structure of the thick uh, myosin molecules or filaments. Uh, they literally have these like head-like structures, right? These heads, they look like snake heads. 
uh, that are there, which have an ATP binding site and an acting binding site on them, okay? So keep this structure in mind because later on we shall see how that helps the muscle contract. Uh, as for the thinner uh, actin protein, it has this, um, this green, poorly vine-like structure called tropomyosin, right? Um, the tropomyosin attaches to this protein called troponin, and the troponin uh, hides a calcium binding site here, okay? Um, right here. So the actually, it has a calcium binding site uh, at the top as labeled here. So once the calcium binds to the troponin, that causes the tropomyosin to move aside, thereby pulling the troponin aside as well. When the troponin move aside, then the myosin heads can attach to the actin. That's what the end result should be. These myosin heads here should be able to attach to these attachment points on the thinner actin filament, okay? So, uh, so keep this picture in mind and we shall see how that uh, whole thing works when a muscle contracts, okay? All right, so this is basically a cross-section, uh, a microscopic cross-section of a skeletal muscle that we are looking at here. So what we have here, as uh, was mentioned before, is a cross-section of the muscle, and uh, you are looking at both the thick and the thin fibers in this view, right? So again, the thick fibers, also called myosin, are right here in the middle, right? And then these ones here are the uh, thin fibers called actin. And one thing that you can appreciate in this picture is the actin fibers do not meet uh, from both ends here, right? So there's a gap in between. And so this gap here is called the H zone, as you can see, right? So what you have in the H zone is only the thick fibers, uh, myosin, no actin here. Now, if you look at the, uh, the I band, which extends again from here to here, that's only thin fibers, only actin, no myosin there. So I band, is only thin fibers and H zone here is only the thick fibers. However, uh, this region, okay, is, uh, is basically, let me see if I can, the A band uh, is where the thick and the thin fibers overlap. You can see both of them coming together here, right? So now when this structure contracts and there's like literally thousands and thousands of these uh, little cross-sectional fibers in each muscle. So how does the muscle contract? You see the uh, thin fibers, they're pulled inwards. They're pulled inwards like this, right? So these two, uh, the thin fibers come in between like a sliding door in between the thick fibers here. Uh, and so that causes the muscle to shorten and that's how the muscle contracts, all right? So now keeping that picture in mind, uh, let's see what will happen to the eye band when these fibers, the thin fibers, uh, basically move inwards, uh, like sliding doors again, right? The eye band is got short, gonna shorten, it becomes smaller. Makes sense, right? Because the uh, thin fibers are again moving in. Uh, what will happen to the A band? Nothing, because the thick fibers don't even move. So the thin fibers might move in, but this structure very much stays the same. So A band doesn't change. When the muscle contracts, the I band kind of disappears, all right? Something to remember. So here in this picture, you can actually look at how those fibers are arranged. In the H zone, there's only thick filaments. In the I band, there's only thin filaments. Uh, filaments in A band, uh, the thick and the thin filaments, they both overlap. You can see them there, okay? So here you're looking at a genetic disorder called Duchenne muscular dystrophy or DMD. Uh, this is an X-linked trait, which means uh, males get it from their mothers because they get their X chromosome. Um, from the mom, of course, right? The Y comes from the dad. I'm talking about the sex chromosomes that determine the sex of the child. So uh, they get an X from mom and a Y from dad. Uh, the X chromosome from the mom might carry the gene for Duchenne muscular dystrophy or DMD, okay? And so what happens here, if you inherit this illness, uh, this genetic disorder is, you start uh, feeling muscle weakness early on during your childhood, all right? And it's like a rapidly progressive deterioration. So it might start in your toes and then moves up to the foot, then the ankle. It's a kind of like an ascending paralysis kind of picture. And uh, uh, unfortunately, there's no cure, all right? Uh, only supportive treatment. Most of these uh, individuals do not survive beyond teenage or early 20s uh, because 
uh, eventually all the muscles are affected. They become weak. Even the diaphragm, which is your respiratory muscle, becomes we so weak that they cannot even breathe properly. And of course, the heart muscle becomes weak too. All muscles are um, afflicted in this disorder. All right. All right. So then uh, here we are looking at um, at what is called a motor unit. Okay. So what is a motor unit? If you look in this picture, uh, here's a nerve fiber. Here's your spinal cord, okay, in a cross section, a transverse section of your spinal cord. Here are the nerves, here are the motor nerves, and the motor nerves are supplying uh, a bunch of fibers, muscle fibers, right? So this entire thing, the nerve and the muscle fibers together, yeah, that's called a motor unit, okay? And the nerves basically come in contact with the muscles at what are called neuromuscular junctions or NMJ neuromuscular junctions. Look at the word itself, the junction between nerve and muscle, okay? And so at the neuromuscular junction is where the, these neurons, these nerves will secrete some neurotransmitter like acetylcholine, about which we will talk more in detail later on, and that might cause the muscles to contract, okay? All right, so, okay, so in this picture, we are looking at what we were just mentioning, neuromuscular junction or NMJ, okay? So here is your nerve. This is the nerve terminal. Uh, here comes your electrical signal. So this is muscle and this is nerve. Here, here's the neuromuscular junction. This is where the two meet. So when the electrical uh, impulse reaches the end of the neuron here, you see those little white bubbles. Those are actually neurotransmitters, chemicals that might cause the muscle to either contract or relax. So then they are secreted in response to this electrical signal. And then they bind to these uh, post synaptic receptors, all right? And then based on what type of a neurotransmitter it is, they might cause the muscle to contract by opening up sodium channels and causing depolarization, or they might cause the muscle to relax by binding to potassium channels and causing repolarization. Depolarization again means when the positive ions move inwards uh, and repolarization is when the positive ions move out, okay? So basically this is what a neuromuscular junction looks like. Here's a, another close up, all right? So again, what happens? Here's the electrical signal, it comes here and uh, it causes the, uh, the synaptic vesicle, this bubble that is carrying the, neuro, the red neurotransmitter and that neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. Now we know because it's mentioned here. Um, and so this uh, round vesicle is burst out here and then it pours out all of the neurotransmitter, which was acetylcholine in the synapse. Synapse is this gap, this little tiny microscopic gap between the nerve and the muscle. So then this acetylcholine swims across the synapse and it binds to these acetylcholine receptors. The acetylcholine receptors uh, in turn open up to what? To sodium ions. Sodium starts to move in and it causes the muscle to depolarize, to contract, all right? And in order for... Uh, and this is exocytosis. Remember what exocytosis was? These uh, uh, vesicles or bubbles are actually throwing out their neurotransmitters on the outside. That's what um, exocytosis was. Uh, and for that to happen, this calcium pump must bring the calcium ions in. It requires the calcium ions to move in so that this vesicle can burst open and release the neurotransmitter for the muscle to contract. So let's see, where's the endomycium? The endomycium is uh, around each individual nerve fiber. Perimycium around each muscle fascicle, uh, all right? Uh, endomycium was around each muscle fiber, perimycium around each muscle fascicle, epimycium across the entire body of muscle. Deep fascia, again, made up, made up of uh, um, connective tissue, right? Uh, dense connective tissue and superficial fascia then, all right? Uh, made up of areolar tissue and fat. Okay, place the following gross anatomic and microscopic anatomic structures in order from largest to smallest, okay? What is the largest? Let's take a look, a fascicle, okay? What comes actually, sorry, muscle. Muscle is the largest, right? Then the fascicle, right? Within the fascicle, you will have a muscle fiber. A muscle fiber will have a sarcomere, within the cycle would be the myofibrils made up of myofilaments. So that is the order. All right, so here we are looking at the steps of how uh, muscle contraction takes place, what happens at the NMJ or the neuromuscular junction, the junction between the nerve and the muscle. So as I was mentioning before, 
we can see it right here. The uh, electrical signal, the electrical nerve travels all the way to the end. And this causes the calcium ion channels to open up. The calcium flows in. The inflow of calcium causes the synaptic vesicles, which are filled up with neurotransmitters in red, you can see the exocytose, they burst open and they release the neurotransmitters within the synapse and the acetylcholine, which is the neurotransmitter, swims across the synapse and binds to these postsynaptic acetylcholine receptors, causing uh, sodium ion channels to open up here on the muscle, sodium moves in, depolarization takes place and the muscle contracts, okay? So uh, let's talk about some uh, disease entities where this muscular contraction is disrupted, such as myasthenia gravis, okay? And even if you look at the term itself, myasthenia, my is for muscle, okay? Uh, asthenia means weakness. Gravis, it's grave or serious, or it might even lead you to your grave, right? Uh, so this is an autoimmune disorder, as we can see here, which by definition means that it's more common in women. Uh, men can be afflicted, but it's uh, found quite more frequently in women, as you can see here. So what happens uh, in this autoimmune disorder is, autoimmune means your own antibodies are attacking or malfunctioning, right? So the antibodies here bind to your acetylcholine receptors. And when that happens, uh, the acetylcholine cannot bind to its receptors because the antibodies block it, right? And so therefore the muscle becomes weak uh, and weaker and weaker. It usually starts in the small muscles of the face. Uh, so you might become like lopsided, right? Uh, you might have like your eye, eyelid drooping on one side, drooling from the mouth, uh, pretty much like what you would see in a stroke, right? In a stroke, when half of your body is afflicted. So let's see, signs and symptoms of um, myasthenia gravis. Okay, so then uh, from the small muscles of the face, then it uh, basically can spread to your limbs and uh, further on, okay? Uh, all right, so now that we know the pathology and the etiology of myasthenia gravis, how might you want to treat it? So first step, uh, well, physical therapy, without any doubt, just like stroke sufferers, uh, you need to exercise the patient's muscle uh, muscles to uh, maintain their function. On top of that, since this is an autoimmune disorder, uh, steroids help, because remember what steroids do is they dampen your immune response. So antibodies don't work as well. Uh, if all else fails, then you can also try something called plasmapheresis, okay? And what is plasmapheresis? Uh, basically, you uh, take out the blood from the patient's body, pass it through a machine which extracts the offending antibodies from the blood. The autoantibodies that are causing the signs and symptoms, those are removed outside of the body and then the blood is returned back to the body. It's kind of like dialysis, okay? Only in dialysis, um, you have to go for these repeated sessions, which we have to do in plasmapheresis often too. Uh, but in, dia uh, in dialysis, uh, you are uh, cleaning out the blood of all the waste products because your kidneys cannot do that. Your kidneys are malfunctioning, right? In plasmapheresis, you're not removing the waste from the blood, rather you're uh, removing the offending autoantibodies, okay? Okay, so, all right, here we are looking at the whole uh, repolarization, depolarization picture, as we, I had mentioned before, right? So your uh, unstimulated muscle fiber it has, a, has an internal resting membrane potential of negative 90 millivolts, as you can see here. So then when the muscle is stimulated because of a nerve, and we looked at all the steps that were involved there, and uh, the sodium ion channels start opening up, the positively charged sodium ions start flowing in, uh, and the uh, electrical voltage becomes a little less negative, like negative 65, that's the threshold. Once you reach the positive value of relatively positive as compared to negative 90 of negative 65, that's when the sodium ion channels all op start opening up in a hurry. And so more and more sodium ions, which are po positively charged cations move inwards. And this causes depolarization, muscle contraction. It goes all the way up to positive 30 millivolts, at which point the sodium ion channels close and the potassium ion channels open up. The potassium starts moving out, which is positively charged again. So because of an efflux of positively charged cation, that is uh, the potassium ions, your, your uh, membrane potential starts to plummet into the negative again. And this is called repolarization, okay? And then it goes all the way, even more negative than 90, and then it's basically maintained at that base level there. All right, let's see. All right, so here we are looking at uh, the steps that are involved 
in your muscle contraction, something I'd mentioned before. Let's take a look at it in a cyclical fashion, right? What exactly happens here? So what you're looking at is the myosin head. We looked at that before. Here's your thick protein uh, filament called um, myosin. Here's the myosin head. And you can see that the myosin head has uh, a place for uh, ADP uh, to attach over here. At the top, you can see the actin, which is the thin filament. And again, remember in actin, you have this uh, protein called, uh, first of all, this green vine-like structure called the tropomyosin, and then the blue protein here called the troponin. Uh, and the troponin is uh, there for attachment of a calcium ion, which is in white here, all right? So let's see what happens when a calcium uh, ion floats in and then attaches to the troponin here. Once the calcium ion attaches to the troponin, the tropomyosin, this green vine-like structure, it pulls the uh, troponin gate, if you will, aside. And when this troponin is moved aside, that bears or exposes the uh, ADP attachment site on the thin actin filament for the thick myosin heads to bind to. So they bind here, right? This is called a cross bridge. They're bound here. So after uh, the head binds to the, the head of the uh, thick myosin filament, of course, binds to the actin, then it moves this way, right? This way. So it moves the uh, thin actin fibers inwards like that. And this is called a cross stroke. All right, the cross stroke, as you can see. So here in this picture, you can see that uh, how it has moved, right? The myosin head has moved inwards. And so there's many myosin heads which are all attached to this actin and they push the actin inwards sliding door mechanism, all of these actins are going to move in uh, because of these uh, cross strokes, right? All of these uh, myosin heads moving inwards. However, uh, ATP was needed for this to be accomplished, but what happens then? Then uh, you need ATP to detach the myosin head from this binding site too, right? So that it can reattach uh, and complete the whole cycle again. Uh, so this is, that's an interesting fact, right? So you do need uh, ATPs for your muscles to be able to contract again. And so this explains uh, a phenomenon that we all know as the uh, stiffness of death or rigor mortis, right? Uh, and we know this, like dead bodies, after they've been dead for a few hours, uh, they be make, basically become stiff. Their muscles are contracted. So what is causing that, right? It's actually this uh, cycle that you're looking at. Since um, ATP formation stops at the time of death, there's no more ATP in the system. Therefore, once the myosin head attaches to the actin, it stays put, it stays attached. There is no ATP to detach uh, this cross bridge formation. So in other words, the muscle is permanently contracted and that is what causes the stiffness of death or rigor mortis, okay? Um, and so of course, after, um, depending on the climate conditions, if it's like hot and wet and like tropical climate, bodies decompose faster as compared to if it's icy and cold. Um, that's why you put food, food, your food in the fridge uh, to keep it uh, as fresh as possible. Uh, but the body decomposes because after a few hours, then uh, your cells, uh, lysosomes start bursting open. And remember your lysosomes were the, the cell zone suicide kit. And so these lysosomes release hydrolytic cannibalistic enzymes that basically self-dissolve and destroy the uh, body's muscle tissue, okay? So there you go. Now you can see, this is a relaxed muscle, right? You can see that the actin, uh, fibers have not been moved in by the um, myosin thick filaments inwards. But here, the muscle is completely contracted. You can see that they have slid inside, right? They've slid inside uh, the, the actin. So this is a contracted muscle. This is what a relaxed muscle looks like under the microscope. And this is what a contracted muscle would appear as, okay? So two other conditions that we are looking at here, something called tetanus and something called botulism. Uh, tetanus is caused by infection with the spore of a uh, gram-positive bacterium called Clostridium tetany, as you can see. And the spores are widespread. They're found, if, especially if you live in like rural country areas, it's uh, in the soil. And if you're not vaccinated against tetanus and you have the ill fortune of scraping your knee on, and get contaminated with the soil containing the spores, well, these spores release a, uh, a toxin, which basically is... Uh, something uh, that inhibits 
the release of your inhibitory neurotransmitter, which means your muscles are in a state of constant contraction. So tetanus is a painful condition. So the, the, the body is painfully contracted, right? Uh, you might see someone who's so badly seizing that only the tip of the, the crown of the head and the heels of the feet touch the bed. The person re really forms a bridge, right? Uh, like an arched bridge uh, because the muscles are so violently contracting. And this is something called uh, opistotonus. Opistotonus, okay. Uh, extreme convulsions in, in tetanus. Uh, and related within the same uh, genus, there's a closely related species of bacterium called Clostridium botulinum, as you can see here, right? And uh, the spores of this bacterium, the sister bacterium, uh, causes a disorder called botulism, which is quite the opposite of tetanus, interestingly, right? Two sister bacteria, but causing uh, opposite side, um, opposite effects. Uh, in botulism, as you can see here, what happens is uh, this toxin prevents the release of acetylcholine at the synaptic knobs, and you need acetylcholine for your muscles to contract, right? So when they are not being released at the synaptic knobs, your muscles go into flaccid paralysis, okay? And uh, so no wonder they use uh, this uh, toxin, the most potent toxin, by the way, the most potent naturally occurring toxin in nature is what you're looking at here, uh, Clostridium botulinum uh, toxin. And if you look at the name a little bit more closely, uh, Botox, which is a short for botulinum toxin. All right, so we have taken the same, the most potent toxin in nature. We have uh, diluted it a little bit with water and we are using it as a cosmetic procedure thing, right? So you, what, because it, what it does, when you inject someone with Botox, like in the, on the forehead and around the eyes and around the lips is, it causes a paralysis of the underlying muscles. So when the underlying muscles are paralyzed, the skin kind of just uh, looks unwrinkled and, uh, more smooth. You also become like a poker face, right? Because of course you do not have the muscles working properly to, uh, to give you all of those facial expressions, interestingly. So what triggers the binding of synaptic vesicles to the synaptic knob membrane to cause exocytosis of ACH or acetylcholine? Uh, calcium ions do. What two events are linked in the physiologic process called excitation contraction coupling? Uh, excitation, when the nerve uh, transmits a neurotransmitter and that neurotransmitter, for example, acetylcholine causes a contraction of the muscle, okay? Uh, and how it happens, we looked at the whole thing, the myosin heads attaching to the actin and the power stroke moving it in and then ATP being attached there and then uh, the myosin head detaches from there. What is the function of calcium ions in uh, skeletal muscle contraction? They initiate the secretion of neurotransmitters at the synapse. Describe the four processes that repeat in cross-bridge cycling. So again, uh, attachment of the myosin head by exposing the, uh, the binding side, the troponin moves aside after the calcium ion binds to it, the tropomyosin puts, pulls it aside. So now the myosin head can bind, then the myosin head moves inwards, right? And then finally ATP attaches back here and it detaches for, for, for the cycle to repeat itself. So what causes the release of myosin head from actin? ATP. What resets the myosin head? The ADP, all right? That's a broken down product of ATP. How do acetylcholinesterase and calcium pump, uh, pumps function in the relaxation of a muscle? Acetylcholinesterase, which is an enzyme, you would have guessed it if you looked at uh, A's, that uh, suffix at the end, uh, which basically breaks down acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is this excitatory neurotransmitter that causes your muscles to contract. Uh, calcium pumps, again, they pump calcium ions out so the muscle does not stay contracted forever, okay? That would be called tetany or tetanus. All right, so here uh, we are looking at how the uh, skeletal muscle gets its energy, right, to function. And so there are basically three ways uh, that this can be done. Uh, using creatine phosphate uh, by glycolysis, and by aerobic cellular respiration. Keep in mind that the most energy efficient uh, and powerful way of powering your muscles is by this aerobic cellular respiration. That's your breathing process. Each breath along with glucose molecule and oxygen 
uh, gives you 36 to 38 ATPs, all right? Glycolysis, which is breathing or respiration in the absence of oxygen or anaerobic respiration, also called fermentation, only gives you two ATPs. And creatine phosphate, creatine is a breakdown product of an amino acid that simply donates extra phosphates to your ADP to generate more ATPs. So you're, you can lift weights or push your body a little bit uh, harder and longer than without creatine, okay? So the age old quest question is creatine safe as a supplement because a whole lot of bodybuilders and people uh, looking to pack on muscle mass fast uh, look to it. Uh, the answer is it depends, right? So uh, for example, if you are not drinking enough water and you tend to be dehydrated or you have kidney disease because of diabetes or whatever, uh, then uh, creatine could accumulate in your body, uh, okay, and cause kidney and liver problems because those organs basically metabolize, metabolize it. Now, but if you're taking minimal uh, doses and you're adequately hydrated, uh, then you can basically, as long as you're keeping your body flushed, uh, that should be fine, okay? So it gives you that 10 to 15 seconds of additional energy by generating extra ATPs in your body. Glycolysis, as I mentioned before, only releases uh, a couple of ATP molecules, okay? Uh, anaerobic cellular respiration. This is basically what powers your muscles for the most part, all right? It happens within the mitochondria. You look at the whole cycle before, glycolysis, citric acid cycle, and then electron transport chain. That's what we're looking at here. There they are, glycolysis, right? And uh, <clears throat> Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle, and then the electron transport chain, so. All right, so uh, now if you do not have enough oxygen while doing an activity like, for example, running a marathon and you've run out of all oxygen available, you're breathing at your maximal rate, that's when the glucose starts getting converted into lactate in the lack of oxygen, right? And lactic acid or lactate is uh, basically a myotoxin. It causes your muscles to ache, you get cramps, you have hit the wall, you cannot go any further, okay? And the enzyme that converts... Uh, pyruvate into lactate is called lactate dehydrogenase, okay? And interestingly, this is uh, also an enzyme which is often measured in heart attacks to, to, to uh, detect a heart attack, LDH in myocardial infarction, okay? And why is that? Because what is a heart attack? What is myocardial infarction? Uh, your heart is being starved of oxygen. It's not getting enough oxygen because there's a blockage in the blood vessels that supply blood and oxygen to the heart itself called the coronary blood vessels, right? So whenever there's a blockage there, um, the, heart, the heart cannot afford to stop or everything else stops. The heart will keep pumping blood and keep beating uh, in the absence of oxygen. In other words, the heart is having to run in a marathon and it, it has just run out of oxygen. So then what will happen to all the glucose within the heart uh, muscle itself? It gets converted into lactate uh, by lactate dehydrogenase. So uh, uh, cardiac ischemia, lack of blood supply and oxygen to the heart, your lactate dehydrogenase levels go up. And if you detect that in the bloodstream, then that is one of the signs that you've had a heart attack. But know that this is not specific or unique to heart muscle by any means. So just because you have high levels of LDH doesn't necessarily mean that you've had a heart attack. It's kind of non-specific. Uh, for specific enzymes, you look at things like CKMB and troponin and those kinds of things, which are more unique. CKMB, creatine kinase type MB, uh, specifically is secreted by the heart muscle, All right? So let's quickly take notes in that regard as well. <clears throat> so this is what you ideally uh, need to do, right? If you look at this picture, so there's three people, one is running a 50 meter race, the other one has 400 meters, and then one is going for the long haul, 1500 meters, right? And so these colors tell you how do they derive their energy. So the guy who's going for the uh, short sprint, this guy is almost all in pink. So available ATP and phosphate transfer or creatine. So immediate energy source. This guy doesn't need to have any long-term energy source, right? The other one, who's running the 400 meter race here is in the orange, which means uh, glycolysis. So um, anaerobic respiration or fermentation is what's happening with this person. And then uh, finally, if you look at the guy uh, running the long run, right, 1500 meters, uh, this guy needs a steady supply of oxygen and ATP 
uh, by means of aerobic cellular respiration. That's the long-term energy source. So you can see all of that here in the pictures. All right, oxygen debt. What that means is um, pretty much like after you've really pushed yourself and you've hit the finish line after a marathon and then you, what happens afterwards, you basically just sit down or you breathe hard. What, what, what are you trying to do when you breathe hard? You're trying to compensate for the lack of oxygen. So this is what is called the oxygen debt. You're taking in adequate oxygen basically to do all of these things, to replace the oxygen on your hemoglobin and myoglobin that you've just lost, to replenish your glycogen and glucose stores, uh, to replenish your ATP and creatine phosphate stores that have gone down and to convert lactic acid back to glucose, okay? So you're doing these four things while paying off the oxygen debt. So um, additional ATP is made immediately through which phosphate containing molecules? Uh, creatine phosphate. What are the various means for making ATP available in a 1500 meter race? Glycolysis and um, aerobic cellular respiration. What is oxygen debt? The extra oxygen that you breathe in after you've hit the wall, right? After you, you have run out of oxygen. And how is the additional oxygen used following intense exercise? To replenish your glycogen, to replenish your ATP stores and all of those things that we looked at, all right? Okay, so here we are looking at different types of skeletal muscle fibers in the spectrum under the microscope. So you have these types. You have the dark red ones called the slow oxidative fibers. You have the slightly lighter ones called the fast uh, oxidative fibers. And then you have almost the white ones, which means not much hemoglobin. They're called the fast glycolytic fibers. All right, so these ones, uh, the, red, the darkest ones, which are the slow oxidative fibers, these are found in abundance in muscles, which you use constantly, like your back muscles that help you stand upwards. We, earlier, we talked about the sexy muscles, if you will. So those muscles uh, have more of these fibers, the slow oxidative fibers, all right? Because they, again, they are in, in, the, in it for, for the long run, right? So just staying upright, back muscles, slow oxidative fibers. So how about these ones, the exact opposite, fast glycolytic fibers. These are found in your biceps uh, for power lifting, right? So short explosive bursts of energy and strength, they come from the fast glycolytic fibers, okay? Uh, and then the fast oxidative fibers are intermediate, like your thigh muscle fibers, okay? Um, now, much of this is also genetic. So for example, if you genetically inherited more of the fast glycolytic type fibers, you're possibly a sprinter or a bodybuilder, right? Short explosive bursts of energy. If you inherited more of the slow oxidative type fibers genetically, uh, then you're more of a, uh, a marathon runner, uh, an endurance athlete. You will go for the long run, right? So it's called, let's make notes here. Uh, genetic muscle fiber basis of, uh, let's say, weightlifters versus endurance athletes. So you are a really good anaerobic exerciser, anaerobic, if you have a lot of uh, these ones, the fast glycolytic fibers, and you're a great uh, aerobic uh, athlete if you have more of these slow oxidative fibers here, okay? So how does a fast twitch fiber differ from a slow twitch? Well, well, a fast twitch fiber is for strength, you know, short bursts of intense strength. Slow twitch fibers are for the long run, okay? Oxidative fibers, long run, glycolytic fibers, short term energy. Which skeletal muscle fiber type is slow and fatigue resistant, slow oxidative? What is the advantage of the skeletal muscle fiber type? It has endurance. Muscles that maintain po posture are composed primarily what type of skeletal muscle fibers of the slow uh, oxidative fatigue resistant type, of course. Because uh, again, as humans, we are upright for most of the time. Okay, what was this? Uh, what occurs in a muscle during a single twitch? Uh, threshold, depolarization, repolarization. Okay. All right, so let's move on here to something called muscle tension. Right? So here we're looking at something called muscle tension, which simply means how much uh, contraction and tension a muscle can generate. Uh, it is measured by means of an instrument called a myogram. Again, myo, remember, it's the prefix for muscle, right? And myogram comes in real handy when you're, for example, evaluating a patient for possible muscular dystrophy, 
or stroke, right? Or some other muscular problem, botulinum poisoning or whatever, where uh, the muscles are not contracting properly. So they're not generating enough tension, okay? So that is what it's used for. All right, so uh, what we are looking at here, uh, the latent period is the time after a muscle is contracted and relaxed that it cannot contract again in spite of how much electrical impulses uh, that you give to the muscle, okay? It's called the latent uh, period uh, or the refractory period. Contraction period is when the muscle is actually contracting, okay? When the tension is increasing there. And then of course, relaxation period, period is when the muscle uh, relaxes after that, okay? So what you can see in this graph here is as you increase the electrical impulse to the mus muscle, uh, you can see here voltage increments, uh, the muscle tension also increases uh, directly. So these two are directly proportional. The greater the voltage administered, the greater the tension of the muscle. But you will reach a point eventually where the muscle starts to have tetany. Skeletal muscle will go into tetany where it's permanently contracted, all right? And that's what we're looking at here. Incomplete tetany or tetany, uh, if frequency, electrical fre frequency is uh, 40 to 50 uh, pulses per second, okay? That's when you start seeing tetany. So there you go. So as we increase the frequency, of the electrical impulse, the muscle tension also starts to increase uh, with it, but it reaches a plateau here, incomplete tetany, and here the muscle just is permanently contracted. And you cannot go on long with this state because muscles fatigue, they get tired. It's like lifting a weight, a heavy weight in your hand, and then eventually you're gonna let go, right? Same with your muscles here. So fatigue and the people in tetany or having tetanus usually die because of respiratory failure, because the diaphragm, the muscle of breathing gets uh, exhausted, fatigued, all right? Okay, so we looked at what happens during these three phases. What is recruitment? Recruitment means more and more muscle fibers are contracting. What happens to skeletal muscle during wave summation? The tension um, and uh, in the muscle fibers keeps increasing. Muscle tone is even when you are not doing any activity, your muscles, body muscles still have like an underlying tone because of a baseline electrical activity always going on. And that's very important because you are still breathing even when you're sleeping and even to maintain your blood pressure, your muscles must be contracting at a basal level. And that's what your muscle tone is. The more physically active you are, the more weights you, that you lift, the more aerobic and anaerobic exercise that you engage in, the better your muscle tone is and the better it's for your heart, for your musculoskeletal system for, for your blood pressure, all kinds of things. All right, so here we're looking at two types. You're looking at a muscle contraction. One type is called the isometric contraction. The other one is called isotonic contraction, right? Uh, isometric, iso means same. So isometric means the length of the muscle doesn't change. For example, holding a weight while the arm doesn't move, just holding it in place, isometric contraction. Isotonic contraction is when the tone doesn't change, but the length of the muscle actually changes. In other words, when you start moving the weight, okay? And so then you have concentric versus eccentric contraction. What's the difference? Uh, so first of all, this is isometric contraction. See the child, the, the person is holding the child to the chest, not moving, but just holding him against gravity, isometric contraction. Now the person has actually moved the child away, isotonic contraction. With movement, you have isotonic contraction. Also, when you move the weight towards yourself, that's called concentric um, action. The muscle shortens. But when you move the weight away from you, as indicated by the blue arrow here, that is called eccentric, uh, which means the muscle actually lengthens, okay? Now, if you're doing something like pushing against a wall or shoveling snow, because your driveway is blocked after a winter storm or something like that, so that is sustained isometric contractions, and that can raise your blood pressure to dangerous levels. Those with uh, like pre-existing hypertension from before, or people who have aneurysms, right? Uh, an aneurysm is like a weakness in your artery. Usually it's in the brain, something called a berry aneurysm, right? So let's call it uh, shoveling snow and berry aneurysms. And so these weak points in your uh, arteries, they might burst. Uh, and the next thing you know, someone sho is shoveling snow and then they just uh, slump down to the ground uh, and they pass away 
even before you can get to them. And then when you do an autopsy, you find out that they had this congenital by birth berry aneurysm. It's called a berry aneurysm because it literally resembles a berry, a weakness in the artery at the base of the brain uh, and that burst because of the, uh, the sustained isometric contraction. So you have to uh, keep that in mind, all right? Even straining at the toilet, some people have burst aneurysms while on the toilet because they were straining and that caused uh, the pressure, intracerebral pressure to increase suddenly uh, and that aneurysm popped. The risk of popping aneurysm, uh, aneurysms also increases with age, all right? With age, risks for aneurysm. Uh, and if you have like a heavy lifting schedule uh, on a regular basis, right? Uh, even things like uh, smoking or drinking too much caffeine that increase your blood pressure momentarily, they can also make you more predisposed to rupturing aneurysm, even like uh, uh, very vigorous sex. If you are, are really that sensitive, that can uh, prove fatal at times, right? Because of again, a berry aneurysm basically uh, contracting, uh, rather rupturing. Okay, so on this graph, you're looking at the length of the sarcomere, which is the muscle fiber, as compared to as uh, compared with the muscle tension. Okay, so at, at which point does the muscle have the most tension? When it's fully contracted, then it's already spent. When it's stretched all the way here, then you need to do even more work to bring it in like this. But when your muscle is in a resting length here, that is when you can reach maximal contraction. So for maximal contraction, your muscle needs to be at resting length, not contracted from before and not overstretched either. So what is the function of skeletal muscle tone to keep your blood pressure steady, to keep you from, to keep you breathing, right? Even while you're asleep, when you flex your biceps while doing bicep, biceps curls, what is the type of movement uh, that is concentric towards the body, concentric? Describe the relative force of contraction that can be developed in your back muscles when you bend at the knees to lift an object and when you bend at the waist to lift an object. Uh, explain the significance, right? So when you bend at the knees, you have significantly more muscle contracting, right? So uh, versus when you use your back to lift, then only a small tiny area of your back uh, is taking all of the brunt of that pressure. And that could be dangerous. That can cause uh, your back to literally break, right? Like a herniated disc or a strains and sprains in the muscle there. It's much better to go down on your knees and then lift it up, right? Uh, unless you have osteoarthritis, that's the other risk. So how can muscle fatigue result from changes in each of the three primary events of skeletal muscle contraction? Because uh, you lose calcium, you lose ATP, you lose hemoglobin or myo oxygen from myoglobin. So. All right, so what is hypertrophy? When uh, you exercise and you lift weights, uh, your individual muscle fibers become thicker, stronger, and uh, larger, and that's called hypertrophy, as you can see here, okay? Um, atrophy is the exact opposite. For example, when you stop working out or if you uh, have cancer or some other wasting disease, your muscles basically break down and become smaller in size. That is called uh, atrophy, right? And so to prevent that, uh, make sure that you're engaging in both aerobic and anaerobic exercise on a regular basis, which is part of my DDS LMP mantra that I mentioned before. So we start losing our muscle mass as early as in our mid thirties, all right? So that's quite early. Uh, and with time, the endurance and the power of the skeletal muscle decreases as we can see here. Um, and uh, the blood flow to the muscles goes down as well. So muscle pains, muscle ruptures, sprain strains, all of them become more common. Uh, unless you keep up with the exercise regimen, right? You have to keep keep the muscles strong. Uh, fibrosis, this is what happens when a muscle dies out, such as if you have a very tight cast after an arm fracture or something like that. And the cast is so tight that it cut out the blood supply to your arm and then it was not removed in time. And that can lead to permanent damage to your muscle, something called fibrosis. When the muscle dies out, it is replaced by dense regular connective tissue and not muscle tissue. So use it or lose it, that's what happens. So the, there are three tissues in the human body which do not regenerate, okay? Uh, instead of regeneration, you get scar tissue if they die. And those are, uh, of course, your skeletal muscles, that's number one, right? Then your cardiac muscle, your heart muscle, and then your neurons your central nervous system. So if you get a heart attack or a stroke or uh, too tight a cast on your arm or something, if these three tissues die out, they're not coming back. All you have instead is uh, 
fibrous tissue, which is dysfunctional. So a lot of people do the do this kind of stuff. They take anabolic steroids to bulk up to get stronger muscles, right? Uh, anabolic, they build muscle, uh, but they have a whole host of side effects uh, attached to them, as you can see here, right? All fatal, basically, increased risk of heart disease and stroke right there, kidney damage, liver tumors, testicular atrophy, breast development, something called uh, gynecomastia, aggressive behavior, high blood pressure, right? Uh, growth of facial hair in women if they take anabolic steroids for um, athletic purposes or whatever. So um, a few years back, there was uh, the case of this uh, famous wrestler of the 80s and 90s called Chris Benoit, uh, the Canadian wrestler. And he was in the news because uh, apparently in a fit of uh, rage, he hung his own wife and their, uh, I think, two-year-old child using the exercise machine itself. And then he hung himself too. And it was quite a shocking incident, right? <clears throat> and so later they found out that he was being prescribed uh, these anabolic steroids in high doses by his doctor. So needless to say, the doctor was persecuted and ended up losing his medical license, all right? So what anatomic changes occur in a skeletal muscle uh, fiber when it undergoes hypertrophy? It becomes bigger, thicker, longer, and stronger. What changes in skeletal muscle occur as a result of aging? Uh, atrophy, the exact opposite. They become weaker and smaller. So here we are looking at cardiac muscles uh, instead of the skeletal muscle. Here's cardiac muscle. And how do you know it's cardiac muscle? First of all, it is highly branched. You see, it almost looks like twigs on a tree, right? So uh, a very branched appearance, plus the most significant appearance uh, feature here is this, uh, this jagged line called the intercalated discs. The intercalated discs, again, are made up of desmosomes and gap junctions, and they ensure that the electrical current is spread throughout the cardiac muscle at the same time, so the heart contracts as a whole unit. So what are some differences uh, between skeletal muscle and cardiac mus muscle? Cardiac muscle has intercalated discs. Uh, skeletal muscle does not. Uh, skeletal muscle is voluntary. Cardiac muscle is involuntary, not under your voluntary control. All right, so here you're looking at uh, the third type of muscle, which is smooth muscle. It's found in places like your digestive organs, in your blood vessels, in the lens of the eye, right? In your urinary tract, all of those places, uterus in the female reproductive tract uh, and the male reproductive tract as well. So here in this picture, you can see the different body areas from which uh, smooth muscles can be derived. You can see them here, okay? And what they do is same thing that all muscles do. They contract and relax. Uh, each smooth muscle fiber or cell is, uh, they're non-striated, non number one, right? There are no striations, the no uh, stripes like a tiger. That is something that we saw with skeletal muscles that's missing in smooth, that's why it's called smooth muscle, non-striated muscle. Uh, each muscle cell is like leaf shaped or spindle shaped as you can see here. And what you see interestingly in this picture uh, is that the actin and the myosin fibers, they're arranged in these little triangles, okay? these triangles is uh, what you will see in smooth muscles. So in other words, when smooth muscles contract, there's no sliding door mechanism like what we talked about in the skeletal muscle. Instead, these triangles, they just contract and become smaller, right? They just get pulled and the triangles become smaller and the smooth muscle contracts. So that's basically uh, what goes on here. It's called the latch bridge mechanism. And we'll take a look at it shortly here. There, there you go, latch bridge mechanism, okay? So instead of, again, sliding door, it's the shortening of the triangles that we just looked at that causes your smooth muscle muscles to contract. Okay, two enzymes, myosin light chain kinase, uh, which phosphorylates the myosin heads uh, when activated by calmodulin, and then the myosin light chain phosphatase that uh, dephosphorylates phosphorylates myosin head so that the muscle can relax. So this one is for muscle contraction, Kinase and phosphatase is for muscle relaxation, smooth muscle relaxation, that is. And so here are the steps of how this latch bridge mechanism works and the smooth muscle contracts. Again, remember, it's not a cross bridge mechanism, a sliding door mechanism, rather the shortening of the triangles, something called the latch bridge mechanism, okay? And here are the individual steps. Uh, so the smooth muscle contraction has a few unique features. Number one, it has a long latent period. Uh, it takes a longer time to phosphorylate the myosin head. So it contracts slowly, but it stays contracted for a long period of time. Anyone who has given birth would know this, right? 
childbirth can be very protracted, a prolonged affair, because the smooth muscle of the uterus, they can stay contracted for long periods of time, long duration, okay? So smooth muscle uh, is also fatigue resistant. It does not get as tired out as easily and as fast as, uh, as skeletal muscle, okay? Uh, and that's because of there's no sliding door. There's the, uh, the triangle shortening uh, mechanism, which can carry on for much longer without getting fatigued. All right. So where is smooth muscle located in the human body, in your viscera, digestive organs, reproductive organs, cardiovascular organs, uh, blood vessels? Uh, how are anchoring proteins and contractile proteins in smooth muscle cells arranged? Again, the triangle picture that I showed you before. What is the specific role of the following? Calmodulin is a protein that uh, stores calcium ions. Myosin light ch chain kinase is important for uh, contraction of the muscle, right? It causes the generation of ATP. And myosin light chain phosphatase is needed for relaxation of smooth muscle. Uh, it breaks down ATP into ADP. What are the steps of smooth muscle contraction? You can look back and take a look at those. Uh, what unique characteristics of smooth muscle allow it to fulfill its functions? It's fatigue resistant because again, there's no sliding mechanism. It does not use as much ATP. It can stay contracted for long periods of time. Uh, so let's say uh, protracted labor and smooth muscle. Okay, uh, what are the various forms of stimulation for controlling smooth muscle? Well, uh, electrical stimulation, right? ATP is what you need as well. Uh, hormones might cause, like oxytocin promotes childbirth, right? All right, explain the stress relaxation response of smooth muscle when uh, smooth muscle is uh, stretched for whatever reason, then it responds by contracting, okay? So uh, it's the opposite, again, negative feedback. Okay. All right, so there we are, we're done with chapter 10. Uh, so please go ahead and uh, uh, make sure that you finish today's lab exam. Tomorrow we have lecture exam again, and then lab exam practical coming up on Thursday. Uh, sorry, we don't have lecture exam tomorrow. We have it on Wednesday, so the same things. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. In the meantime, stay safe, healthy, and happy. And I will hopefully see you all virtually uh, tomorrow with uh, chapter 11, all right? It has two parts, so we, we shall see how much we can get done tomorrow. Uh, all right, have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye.